thank you all for joining us for our third presentation of our summer seminar series, Racism, a Public Health Crisis. My name is Dr. Tamarsha Lali. I'm a human development professor here at Eckerd and coordinator of the seminar, along with Dr. Bonner and Robin Hopewell. So today I am happy to introduce you to Dr. Martinez, who brings her specialized teaching experience to the Department of History at Florida State University and to us today, luckily. Dr. Megan Helena Martinez was born and raised in Miami, Florida. She graduated with her BA from Florida State University in 2006, where she double majored in American history and English literature. She continued her graduate studies at Florida State, receiving her master's in 2008 and PhD in 2018 in African American history, specializing in racial violence and lynching in the early 20th century. She primarily researches the history of racial violence and racial inequality in the US and its legacies. Her current work focuses on racial violence and historical memory in North Florida in the 1920s. She teaches race, ethnicity, and nationality in the United States, American history survey course, US history post 1865 and on, and a special topics course titled Racial Violence in Modern America. Her research interests include US post 1865, African American history specializing in racial violence and lynching in the early 20th century. So that thank you so much, uh, Dr. Martinez for being here with us and we're really looking forward to your presentation. So I'm gonna pass it to you. Thank you very much. Um, let me get my, my screen shared. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited um, to be here today to have this conversation with you all because I think this is an incredibly important conversation. And um, while it's an important conversation, it's not often pleasant to hear about difficult um, and violent aspects of our history, but we're not here today for pleasantries. We're here today to discuss the truth. So just keep that in mind as we move forward. At no time in American history has the health of Black Americans been on par with the health of white Americans? Ooh, let me make sure I can click on this. All right, uh, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that there are huge disparities in the health of white and Black Americans. There are also huge disparities in the healthcare coverage, chronic health conditions, mental health, and mortality rates of white Americans and Black Americans. I'm gonna give you some examples of that. 11% of Black Americans lack health insurance compared to 6% of white Americans. 13% of Black American children have asthma compared with 8% of white children. 42% of Black adults over the age of 20 suffer from hypertension compared with 30% of white adults. Only 9% of Black American adults receive mental health services compared with 19% of white adults. Only 6% of Black American adults receive prescription medication for health services, compared with 15% of white adults. Black Americans have the highest mortality rate for all cancers combined, compared with any other racial or ethnic group. And there are 11 infant deaths per 1,000 live births among Black Americans, which is almost twice the national average of 5.8 infant deaths per 1,000 live births for white Americans. These are just a few examples. There's a saying that goes, when whites catch a cold, black folks get pneumonia. This folk, excuse me, this folk saying reflects a pattern. When a disease hits America, it hits black America even harder. From the earliest days of enslavement, the policies and practices of the white medical community have had an enormous impact on the health of black Americans. Or as Bird Clayton noted in the article that you read for today, racism is in part responsible for the fact that African Americans, since arriving enslaved, have had the worst health care, the worst health status, and the worst health outcomes of any racial or ethnic group in the United States. Many famous doctors, philosophers, and scientists of each historical era were involved in creating and perpetuating racial inferiority mythology and stereotypes. We're gonna to talk today about what exactly that means. The story of racism in medicine is not uniquely American. The development of Western medicine was always intertwined with racism and a belief in white supremacy. 
Men like Carl Linnaeus believed that skin color was a legitimate way to classify mankind. He believed that white Europeans were superior to all other races and placed Africans at the bottom of his hierarchy. He even had a special category for the Khoikhoi tribe in southwestern Africa. He believed that their skin was so dark, even darker than what he would call regular Africans, that they might not even be human anymore. He actually categorized this particular tribe as mythical creatures rather than human beings. Sarah Bartman was a member of the Khoikhoi tribe that Carl Linnaeus was so afraid of. Bartman's buttocks and genitals were irregularly large compared to her fellow Khoikhoi women. They were also irregularly large compared to African women in general. And yet Bartman's large buttocks was presented to the world and especially Europeans as quote unquote, authentically African. She was billed on stage in a freak show in London's West End as what they called the hot and tot Venus. It was a derogatory name for Khoi Khoi women. And it forever linked black women to this idea of having a big buttocks. Bartman was taken to London in July of 1810 and eventually sold to an exhibitor named Henry Taylor. She appeared in an opera in the Vaudeville Theater. The show used her black body as a punchline. The joke being that young French men could enjoy sex with her, but that they could never actually find a black woman attractive as marriage material. In January of 1815, an animal showman purchased Bartman and he used to parade her, sometimes even with a collar around her neck, at cafes, in restaurants, and soirees among the Parisian elites. One day in March of 1815, he took Bartman to the Museum of Natural History in Paris. At the time, the Natural History Museum in Paris claimed the world's greatest collection of natural objects. He met with one of Europe's most distinguished intellectual and comparative anatomists named George Cuvier. Now remember, George Cuvier was a man who's incredibly well respected as a great thinker and a great mind. And this is what he had to say about Sarah Bartman and, and people like her. He said, the white race is actually the most beautiful of all races and is actually physically superior to all races. So we're seeing again at the beginning of this kind of thought that human beings are being classified as either superior or inferior based simply on the color of their skin. In his lab, Cuvier asked Sarah Bartman to take off her skirt and she refused. He tried to document her body with her clothes on instead. And over the course of the next three days, he measured and drew every inch of Sarah Bartman's body. Later that year, unfortunately, Sarah Bartman died. We think it was probably due to pneumonia. Oops, sorry. With Bartman dead, Cuvier finally had his chance to document her body. He secured her corpse and brought her to his laboratory. He removed her clothes, he cracked open her chest wall, removed and studied all of her major organs. He spread her legs, he studied her buttocks, he cut out her genitals, setting them aside for preservation. After Cuvier finished, he reassembled her bones into a skeleton and then added her remains to his world famous collection in the Natural History Museum. In his report, he claimed to have, quote, never seen a human head more resembling a monkey's than hers. The Khoi people, he concluded, were more closely related to ape than to human. And again, please remember, this was Europe's most distinguished intellectual. In 1787, a treatise on tropical disease and on the climate of West Indies was written by a British doctor named Benjamin Mosley. Mosley claimed that black people could bear surgical operations much better than white people. And this is what he said. What would be the cause of insupportable pain to a white man, a Negro would almost disregard. To drive home his point, he added that he had personally amputated the legs of many black people who have held the upper part of the limb themselves with no anesthetics. So again, we have people like Cuvier and Mosley and their beliefs about black bodies, the fact that they were inferior, this idea that they could bear pain better than white people could, these ideas were embraced by so-called intellectuals, not just in Europe, but worldwide and particularly 
by anyone hoping to find evidence of black inferiority in order to justify their participation in slavery and the slave trade. Slavery existed as a legal institution in the United States from 1654, well, early America, to 1865. During this time, American medical policies and practices were informed by principles based in exactly the type of scientific racism that Cuvier and Mosley espoused. If you're making a lot of money off of slavery, whether as someone involved in the Atlantic slave trade or as a plantation owner, Pseudoscience offered you an easy justification for your sins. In the 19th century, phrenology was a pseudoscience that was used to quote unquote prove the inherent superiority of white genes. Phrenologists would study, and please note my finger quotes because all of this is pseudoscience, which means it's fake, but it's what people perpetuated and believed to be real science. So these phrenologists believed that they were studying the skull, skulls from around the world. They would measure them, they would look at the slope of the forehead, they would check the skull for bumps, and then they used that data to make racist conclusions. And they would say, you know what, we looked at this skull and it, it, it's clear to us that Europeans are just inherently smarter. You know, white people are more adept at leadership, they're more capable. And Africans, you know, they're just inherently slower they're less intelligent, and they're more suited to work with their hands and do physical labor. They perpetuated these myths that Black people had large sex or organs and small skulls. Um, again, they also perpetuated the idea that Black people had a higher tolerance to heat. Again, if you uh, think of you know, people who are enslavers, all of this is very convenient information for them to have. This was allegedly science. This is what was called medicine. Eventually, this would all be debunked. You know, phrenologists weren't really reading skulls. They just attributed racist characteristics to skulls when they knew that they had come from Africa. But these racist myths, presented as fact and legitimized in medical journals, shaped society's view that enslaved people were just more naturally fit for forced agricultural labor. They referred to pseudosciences as justification for racist ideology and discriminatory public policies. All of these factors contributed to the fact that healthcare for Black Americans was inferior, inconstant, and largely unavailable for the better part of American history. From the days of slavery, the policies and practices of the white medical community have had an enormous impact on the health of Black Americans. What little healthcare was provided for the enslaved was definitely not the best available. The enslaved were treated with very little regard to their overall health. They were looked at as workers and nothing more. So if you had a broken ankle and they needed you to work, they'll probably try to give you something to help you work through the pain or maybe even help your ankle. But anything that was not physically visible, um, you know, they're not gonna call a doctor for that. If you were a person who experienced something like migraines, for example, or if you suffered from mental health conditions, you know, they're not going to call a doctor um, to actually care about your overall well-being. People have also asked me, you know, what was going on in free Black communities at this time, because even prior to the Civil War, there were free Black communities in America, and people have wondered what their health care options were like. Unfortunately, in free Black communities, their health care was often worse than what was available for enslaved people. Because a wealthy white man hiring a doctor to come look at his you know, property, enslaved people, was actually a lot easier to find than a free Black person themselves in need of medical care. It wouldn't be until 100 years after the Civil War ended in 1964 that it would finally become illegal for hospitals to turn away Black patients. So for free Black populations, healthcare was incredibly difficult to come by. And overall, Black health was the poorest of any racial or ethnic group in America. Healthcare for the enslaved got a little bit better after 1807. Because in 1807, the price of slaves went up. As it became more and more expensive to purchase new slaves, enslavers became more invested in providing medical care for the individuals that they already owned. 
Slave hospitals sprung up around slave trading centers in places like Augusta, New Orleans, and Charleston. They treated sick enslaved people marked for sale and also to heal those who were considered valuable workers. However, these hospitals did not just bring healing to the enslaved community. They would contribute to its horrors when they looked to black bodies for medical experiments. John Brown was an enslaved man in Northampton, Virginia in 1840. This is a portrait of him here. His owner was a white man named Thomas Stevens. And he had, had been in possession of John Brown for 14 years when he suddenly became very sick. And by which I mean Thomas Stevens, the enslaver, became very sick. Eventually, he went to a very well-known physician at the time, Dr. Hamilton, Dr. Thomas Hamilton. And Dr. Hamilton actually was able to cure Thomas Stevens. So in order to thank the doctor for his work, Stevens told Hamilton, you know, you can have anything you want. If you need something, let me know, I'll make it happen. At the time, Dr. Hamilton was interested in learning more about cures for sunstroke. So he told Stevens that he wanted to, quote, borrow um, John Brown, Stevens, you know, a man who was enslaved to Stevens, in order to use him for medical experimentation. So Stevens left Brown with Hamilton, essentially transforming the man's body into both a form of payment for his own health and into an experimental guinea pig. Hamilton used Brown for a series of experiments in an attempt to learn about the human body. In his first experiment, Hamilton subjected Brown to extreme heat from a fire to induce heat stroke. Hamilton gave Brown various types of medicines and remedies and then watched as Brown faded in and out of consciousness until he inevitably passed out. After a period of trial and error involving various tests where Brown was exposed to unbearable temperatures, Hamilton concluded that cayenne pepper tea was the best cure for heat stroke. Hamilton was interested in more than just scientific advancements. He was interested in you know, making money for himself. So eventually he marketed his quote unquote discovery by selling placebo pills made out of flour. And he told his patients and customers to dissolve those pills in cayenne pepper tea in order to help cure their sunstroke. And he financially profited from Brown's suffering. Dr. Hamilton's experiments were also not limited to simply finding cures for heat stroke. His various tests physically and mentally destroyed John Brown. Brown, Brown lost his ability to work in the field and was ultimately thrown out. He was called useless and unwanted. After all of this abuse, Brown finally made up his mind to escape. He reached out to contact Buck Hurd, who was a man who happened to be um, a white slave stealer, like he was known as a person who would go and steal enslaved people. And he asked him for help um, in order to escape. And Buck Hurd agreed to help him. So despite warnings of the extreme danger of you know, attempting to escape, Brown's desperation overshadowed his fear. He was unable to imagine anything worse than the unbearable reality of his life. Incredibly, John Brown survived Hamilton's experiments and successfully escaped slavery in 1847, traveling to London. In 1855, he published his memoir in London. It was called Slave Life in Georgia, a narrative of the life, sufferings, and escape of John Brown, a fugitive slave now in England. The narrative was dictated to a helper who wrote it for Brown, recounted his life, and later escaped from slavery in Georgia. After he escaped, Brown lived out his life in London, where he also married an English woman. In his narrative, he said this, the little I have told may afford an insight into the system of slavery, but it's only a small peep. I have suffered enough myself, but others have endured and are daily enduring perhaps much more. You may have heard of Dr. J. Marion Sims, an American surgeon known as the father of modern gynecology. Vesico vaginal fistula was a common issue in American women in the 19th century. It was caused during childbirth and resulted in a tear between the bladder to the vagina. No successful surgery had been developed at that point in order to cure the condition until Dr. Sims perfected a successful surgical technique in 1849. That's why he's called the father of modern gynecology. 
Sims was from South Carolina and he had graduated from Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. He was a pro-slavery advocate and he also experimented on black women in order to perfect this surgical technique. Enslaved women who suffered from VBF were taken to Sims by their enslavers when they were in so much pain that they could no longer continue to work. The enslaved women had absolutely no say about what would happen to their bodies. Sims used seven enslaved women as unwilling experimental subjects. The first one um, that he operated on was named Lucy. Sims was positive that he was on the verge of making an astounding medical discovery. He invited local doctors to watch his first operation and what he thought would be a historical event. He performed the operation on Lucy. She was operated on without any anesthetics as Sims was unaware of the advances that had been made in anesthetics. The surgery lasted for an hour and Lucy endured excruciating pain while positioned on her hands and knees. She must have felt incredible humiliation and pain as 12 doctors observed the operation. The operation ultimately failed. Lucy nearly lost her life due to an experimental procedure Sims used in her surgery. She became incredibly ill with fever and blood poisoning. The next woman who he experimented on was Anarka. Despite Lucy's close call with death, Dr. Sims continued his experiments. He operated on Anarka. Her condition improved considerably after the surgery, but it still wasn't perfect. With subsequent operations, Sims developed new instruments and acquired new knowledge as he progressed closer to a cure, the whole time cutting into the genitals of enslaved women who were not given anesthetics and who had not consented to the surgeries. The amount of pain and suffering he caused to those women was immeasurable. Anarka's VBF was eventually cured, but only after she endured 13 separate operations without any anesthetics. After his success, Sims became popular with white women who also suffered from VBS. They heard he had found a way to cure their issue. Many of them came to him for treatment after they heard about his successful surgery. However, not one of those women was able to endure the pain of even a single operation. To give you a few other examples, um, a physician and slave owner named William Aiken of Winsboro, North Carolina, recalled an 1852 experiment on an enslaved woman named Lucinda who suffered from a bony growth around her right eye. Aiken and the other doctors disfigured, disfigured her by boring holes into her head without chloroform, a gas that was used at the time as an anesthetic to remove the growth. In another instance, an enslaved woman named Harriet who was suffering from seizures was electrically shocked in an 1848 experiment for 53 minutes. It required three doctors to restrain her. When she told doctors that her back felt like it was being burned, they insisted that it was a sign that the electrotherapy was working. Medical experiments performed on enslaved black bodies were horrifying. Ironically, they also proved to be an acknowledgement of general black humanity, specifically of the inarguable human similarity between white and black people. The exploitation of enslaved people was both a common and generally accepted practice in the South in particular. We're still learning today about the extent to which enslaved people were used in medical experimentation. In the summer of 1989, construction workers unearthed 10,000 bones from a basement in the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta. Many of the bones showed signs of dissection. Forensic investigators determined they were the legacy of five decades of grave robbing intended to provide medical students before and after the Civil War with black cadavers for anatomical lessons. This practice did not end until the early 20th century because as people said, physicians needed to learn anatomy and enslaved people provided a supply of bodies. From the beginning of America, the assumption is that it was normal for black people to be in poor health. Published around the same time as Mosley's treaty about black bodies being able to endure more pain, Thomas Jefferson wrote his own uh, treatise called Notes on the State of Virginia. And Notes on the State of Virginia 
is also going to have an indelible impact on the medical field. Of course, Jefferson was an enslaver himself, owning over 600 souls over the course of his life. In notes on the state of Virginia, Jefferson listed what he claimed were, quote, the real distinctions which nature has made between black and white people. And he claimed that one of those distinctions was that black people lacked a strong lung capacity. Now keep this in the back of your mind as we move forward, because again, while there was no sound medical evidence to support this theory about black people's lung capacity, it will become a commonly held belief that they do. So remember that towards the end of this lecture. In the years that followed, physicians and scientists embraced Thomas Jefferson's unproven theories, no one more aggressively than Samuel Cartwright, an American physician and professor of what he called, quote unquote, Negro diseases. Cartwright conveniently saw forced labor or enslavement as the way to, quote, vitalize black, butt, black blood and correct so-called health issues that black people had. In particular, he said that forced labor would help correct the issue that Thomas Jefferson had identified. Even more outrageous, Cartwright claimed that enslaved people were prone to a, quote, disease of the mind or a mental illness called dreptomania, which would cause them to run away from their enslavers. And just think about that, claiming that the only reason why an enslaved person would try to escape enslavement, to escape bondage, is because they were suffering from a mental illness. Cartwright wrote this. The cause in the most of cases that induces the Negro to run away from service is as much a disease of the mind as any other species of mental alienation and much more curable as a general rule. With the advantages of proper medical advice strictly followed, this troublesome practice that many Negroes have of running away can be almost entirely prevented although the slaves be located on the borders of a free state within a stone's throw of the abolitionists. So if enslaved people are trying to run away or fight back or resist slavery, you don't have to worry about that. That doesn't have to make you feel bad. They're actually mentally ill. That's why they're trying to do those things. Now, aside from the obvious white supremacist nonsense, Cartwright's racist pseudo psychology illustrates another delusion. The justification of continued oppression by portraying Black people's desire for freedom as a sickness that infected Black brains. Willfully ignorant, excuse me, willfully ignoring the violent and inhumane conditions that drove desperate men and women to attempt escape, Cartwright insisted without any irony that enslaved people contracted this disease when their enslavers treated them as human beings or as equals. He told enslavers, you cannot treat enslaved people well. You must not show them any respect or human kindness because if you do, they'll develop this mental disorder, dreptomania. Again, a very convenient science for enslavers to embrace. Cartwright even had a prescriptive measure for preventing dreptomania. He said, you should quote, whip the devil out of enslaved people in order to ensure that they would not develop this disease. On June 1st, 1865, after the end of the Civil War, Congress established the Medical Division of the Freedmen's Bureau, America's first federal health care program to address the health crisis that was Black health in America. Freedmen was the term used to uh, refer to formerly enslaved Black Americans. For hundreds of years, Black health had been completely ignored in America. For hundreds of years, Black bodies had been brutalized and experimented on. This healthcare program was supposed to address those issues, but officials only sent about 120 doctors to the war-torn southern region, and then they ignored those doctors when they said they needed more personnel, more equipment, and more money to actually do their jobs. They erected more than 40 new hospitals, which seemed like an important advancement, but soon those hospitals were abandoned. As historian Jim Downs writes, Federal policy reflected white ambivalence at every turn regarding black health. White legislators argued that free assistance of any kind would cause dependence. And that when it came to black sickness, hard labor 
was a better cure than medicine. This happened a lot at the end of slavery. We see radical Republicans in Congress say things like, hey, black people have been enslaved for hundreds of years. They've been denied education, they've been denied opportunity, and now they need resources in order to create lives for themselves in a free society. They need land, they need job opportunities, they need help. But right alongside those radical Republicans will be moderate Republicans and Democrats who claim that giving anything to newly freed black folks was unfair to white people. So even when they're given land, it'll be taken away. Even when they're given hospitals, they'll be abandoned. Ultimately, the government will be more invested in helping white Southerners get their former plantations up and running again than in giving black people the resources needed in order to truly live free lives. As the death toll rose among those newly freed, a new theory developed among white Americans. They thought maybe this was the case. They thought black people are so ill-suited to freedom that the entire race is just going extinct. You know, black people just didn't know how to take care of themselves. They couldn't survive in freedom. And an Illinois Congressman, Samuel Cox actually said this, no charitable black scheme can wash out the color of the Negro, change his inferior nature or save him from his inevitable fate. Cox was not the only American who felt this way. After Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, Andrew Johnson became president. And Johnson had no intention of helping newly freed black Americans. Even though he served as Lincoln's vice president, he had been an enslaver himself. And once he was president, Johnson said this, this is a country for white men and by God, as long as I am president, it shall be a government for white men. One of the most eloquent replies to this theory that black people were going extinct because they just weren't cut out for freedom came from a black woman herself, Rebecca Lee Crumpler. She was America's first black woman doctor. Crumpler was born free and trained in practice in Boston. At the end of the Civil War, she joined the Freedmen's Bureau and worked in the freed people's community in Virginia. In 1883, she published one of the first treatises on the burden of disease in black communities. And she said, they seem to forget there is a cause for every ailment and that it may be in their power to remove it. Black people are not inherently in poor health. They are not going extinct because they do not know how to live in freedom. There is a cause for their poor health and it can be fixed. Despite Crumpler's pleas, racism continued to define American medicine moving into the 20th century. The nation's earliest hospitals discriminated against and sometimes medically abused their patients. Even those places that accepted black patients had very little to offer, consistently providing the lowest level of medical care. By 1900, the medical field had become professionalized and as, a prof as the profession developed, it was clear that black Americans would not be welcomed in it. Professional societies like the American Medical Association banned black doctors, medical schools excluded black students, and most hospitals and health clinics segregated black patients. For more than 100 years, the AMA actively reinforced or passively accepted racial inequalities and the exclusion of black physicians. The American medical profession upheld racial segregation, writing off the black community as what they called, quote, a debauched, syphilis-soaked, unfit race. Driven by misinterpretations, pseudoscience, um, scientific misrepresentations, uh, the literature that developed at this time um, had a major influence on the field of medicine as it developed. More and more people began to believe myths and lies about black bodies. Even as Americans move forward, theoretically leaving slavery in the past, the damage caused by scientific racism had already been done. It had become part of America's fabric. American medical journals and textbooks were laced with pseudoscientific racist principles, derogatory racial character references, and inferences that black people would eventually go extinct because they couldn't quote, take care of themselves. Black patients would continue to play the same role in freedom that they had played in bondage, being used for risky surgical and experimental procedures. Johns Hopkins University, considered America's premier medical school, 
would guide American medical education over the course of the next 70 years. They opened with rigidly segregated classes, hospitals, and a staff in 1893. The school remained segregated well into the 1960s, 100 years after slavery ended. Despite this history, though, Johns Hopkins will forever be tied to a Black woman, Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks was born in Roanoke, Virginia in 1920. Like most members of her family, she worked as a tobacco farmer from a young age. She fed the animals, tended to the garden, and worked in the tobacco fields. She attended the designated Black school two miles away from her family's home, but she had to drop out in sixth grade in order to help financially support her family. On January 29, 1951, Henrietta Lacks went to Johns Hopkins. It was the only hospital in the area that treated Black patients. She felt what she called a knot in her womb. She had previously told her family about the knot, and they assumed, correctly, that she was pregnant. But after giving birth to her son, Joseph, Lax had a severe hemorrhage. Her primary care doctor tested her for syphilis, which came back negative, and referred her back to Johns Hopkins. When she was back at Johns Hopkins, her doctor, Howard W. Jones, took a biopsy of a mass found on Lax's cervix. Soon after, Lax was told that she had cervical cancer. Henrietta Lax died in 1951 at 31 old, 31 years old. Unbeknownst to her, her doctors at Johns Hopkins had taken samples of her cancerous cells while diagnosing and treating the disease. They gave some of the tissue to a researcher without lax knowledge or consent. In the laboratory, her cells turned out to have an extraordinary capacity to survive and reproduce. They were in essence immortal. The researcher shared them widely with other scientists and they became a workhorse of biological research. Today, work done with what are called HeLa cells, Henrietta Lacks, underpin much of modern medicine. They have been involved in key discoveries in many fields, including cancer, immunology, and infectious disease. One of the most recent applications of HeLa cells is research for vaccines against COVID-19. But the story of Henrietta Lacks also illustrates the racial inequities that are embedded in the United States research and healthcare systems. Henrietta was a black woman. The hospital where her cells were collected was only one of a few that provided care for black people. None of the biotechnology or other companies that profited from her cells passed any of that money back to her family. And for decades after her death, doctors and scientists repeatedly failed to ask her family for consent as they, reveled, as they revealed Lax's name publicly gave her medical records to the media and even published her cell's genome online. Henrietta Lacks has dozens of descendants who hope that those who benefit from her, the research done with her cells will celebrate her life and legacy. Her granddaughter, Jerry Lacks White said this, I want scientists to acknowledge that HeLa cells came from an African-American woman who is flesh and blood, who had a family and who had a story. One of the most famous incidents of medical experimentation on black bodies in American history was the Tuskegee experiment. The Tuskegee experiment began in 1932 at a time when there was no known treatment for syphilis. After being recruited by the promise of free medical care, 600 African-American men in Macon County, Alabama were enrolled in the project, which aimed to study the full progression of the disease. The participants were primarily sharecroppers most of them had never had the opportunity to visit a doctor in their lives. Doctors from the United States Public Health Service, which was running the study, told the patients, 399 men with latent syphilis and a control group of 201 others who did not have the disease, that they were being treated for quote unquote bad blood, a term that was commonly used at the time to refer to any number of ailments. The men were monitored by health workers, but only given placebos, such as aspirin or mineral supplements, including the ones who truly had syphilis. And this was all despite the fact that penicillin became the recommended treatment for syphilis in 1947, about 15 years into the study. The public health service researchers convinced local physicians in Alabama not to treat the participants with penicillin 
and instead research was done at the Tuskegee Institute. In order to track the disease's full progression, researchers provided no effective care as the men died, went blind, or went insane, or when they experienced other severe health problems due to their untreated syphilis. In the mid-1960s, a PHS venereal disease investigator in San Francisco named Peter Buxton found out about the Tuskegee study. He expressed his concerns that this study was unethical. In response, PHS officials formed a committee to review the study, but ultimately decided to continue it with the goal of tracking the participants until all had died. Autopsies were performed and the project data could be analyzed. Buxton leaked the story to a reporter friend who finally passed it along to a fellow reporter at the Associate Press. Heller broke the story in July of 1972, prompting a public outrage and finally forcing the study to shut down. And it's incredible when you think that the study went on from 1932 to 1972. And if it hadn't been for that expose, they would have just gone on until all these men had died so that they could study syphilis. By that time, by the time that this study was shut down, 28 participants had died from syphilis. 100 participants had passed away from related complications. 40 of their spouses were diagnosed with syphilis and the disease had been passed to 19 children at the time of their birth. In 1973, Congress held hearings on the Tuskegee experiments and the following year, the study's surviving participants, along with the heirs of those who died, received a $10 million out of court settlement. New guidelines were also issued to protect human subjects in US government funded research projects. Still, the fact that this was going on in 1973 tells us a lot about how much racism had infected America's medical field. Black people have been in America since 1654, as long as any British colonial and 320 years later, they were still being subjected to medical experiments and unethical medical cruelties. After the, and in addition to this, the Tuskegee experiment was hardly an isolated incident. Mary Alice Relf was 14 years old and Minnie Relf was 12 years old when they became the victims of the abusive practice of sterilizing poor black women in the South. Their mother, who had very little education and was also illiterate, signed an X on a piece of paper, expecting her daughters would be given birth control shots. She was told that she would not continue to qualify for government assistance until her daughters were given the shots. Minnie Ralph remembers that the doctor told her her daughters would simply get some shots. Minnie Lee and Mary Alice Ralph were poor, they were black, they lived in public housing and the state did not think twice about sterilizing them. Alabama doctors and legislators were convinced that the girls were too likely to become a quote unquote burden on state resources if they were to have children. That day in 1973, it did not matter to the federally funded Montgomery Family Planning Clinic that the girls themselves were children or that their parents did not give informed consent for the procedure. The young women were surgically sterilized and robbed of their right to ever bear children of their own. The girls were eventually sent home after the operation was complete. Their father noticed scar tissue formed on both of his youngest daughter's bodies. He asked his social worker to find out what had actually happened in the clinic. After the surgery, the girls were given shots every 90 days in order to ensure their sterilization. Once Lonnie and Minnie Ralph came to the realization that their daughters had been sterilized without their consent, they filed for a lawsuit with the help of the Southern Poverty Law Center. It's really important here that we understand the federally funded part of these stories, because what that means is that the federal government is paying for these individuals to be sterilized. This isn't happening because of individual racism. It's not happening because one doctor or a few doctors harbor racist notions about black people. It's happening because of systemic racism, the type of racism that is embedded in our society, in this case, in the medical field. And there's always going to be an intersection of race and class because some poor white people 
were sterilized as well. But the overall numbers show us that the main target of these practices were black women. The Southern Poverty Center filed a lawsuit on behalf of the Ralph family and exposed the widespread sterilization abuse funded by the federal government that had been practiced for decades. The district court found an estimated 100,000 to 150,000 poor people had been sterilized annually under federally funded programs. Countless others were forced to agree to be sterilized when doctors threatened to terminate their welfare benefits unless they consented to the procedures. The judge ultimately prohibited the use of federal dollars for involuntary sterilizations and also prohibited the practice of threatening women on welfare with the loss of their benefits if they refused to comply. The lawsuit also led to requirement that doctors obtain informed consent before performing sterilization procedures. But the Ralph sisters were hardly the only black folks affected by practices like this. For more than four decades, North Carolina's statewide eugenics program forcibly sterilized about 7,600 people, most of whom were black. Eugenics is, again, a pseudoscience, so check the air quotes. Eugenics is the science of creating the perfect human. Now, in order to, to create the perfect human, you have to first determine what the perfect human looks like. And in America, perfect often looked white. Anything associated with blackness was also associated with the idea of sickness. So as eugenics boards worked to sterilize the most undesirable people in their state, their focus was mainly on black communities. Duke University professor William A. Darity Jr., who studies public policy, economics, and African-American history, co-authored a report that was published in the American Review of Political Economy that correlates 10 years of forced sterilization in counties across North Carolina with the number of unemployed black residents, finding that this program was all but designed to quote, breed black people out. And he said this, this suggests, his findings suggest that for blacks, eugenic sterilization was authorized and administered with the aim of reducing their numbers in the future population, genocide by any other name. North Carolina's eugenics program was one of many in the United States targeting people with illness or disabilities living in state institutions. But it was touted as you know, one, of, uh, one of several solutions to poverty. That means sterilization petitions were not only submitted by hospitals, but were also submitted by welfare officials. Darity and his colleagues, um, Gregory N. Price, an economics professor at the University of New Orleans, and Rhonda V. Sharp, the founder and president of the Women's Institute for Science, Equity, and Race, analyzed more than 2,100 forced sterilizations that occurred in North Carolina between 1958 and 1968. The trio specifically looked at what is known as the surplus population, meaning people who are not part of the labor force and often need government assistance. During that 10 year period, what they found was that local sterilization rates paralleled the size of its surplus population only when that population was black. What do I mean by that? What they found when they analyzed these numbers is that unemployed white people on government assistance were considered worthy of becoming parents. They were not sterilized, but black unemployed people on government assistance, they were not afforded those same rights. Those were the people who were targeted for sterilization. And Darity concluded his report saying this, the United Nations official definition of genocide includes, quote, imposing measures to prevent births within a national, eth ethnically, racial, or religious group. North Carolina's disproportionate use of eugenic sterilization on its black citizens was an act of genocide. You might be asking yourself, how can this happen? How can, for example, North Carolina carry out a sterilization program like this funded by federal dollars? To understand that, we have to go back in time a bit. 
In the decades following Reconstruction, which is what we call the period after the Civil War, former slave states in the South held enormous power in Congress. They formed a voting bloc that was uniformly segregationist. Segregation meaning, you know, white people over here, black people over here. Everyone stays separated. Those segregationists, those politicians who believed in segregation, they were able to preserve segregation in their states, even, it was, even after it was outlawed nationally in 1964. They claimed that calls to desegregate were what they called government overreach. They're like, you can't, you can't tell us what to do here. We're in charge of what goes on in our state. If we want things to be segregated, we should be allowed to do that. This is how we all get, this is how it all kind of comes together though. In 1945, President Truman called on Congress to expand America's hospital systems as a part of a larger healthcare plan. The Hill Burton Act provided federal grants for hospital construction to communities in need, giving priority to rural areas, many of which were in the South. That part was very good for black communities in the South. However, those segregationist politicians, they demanded some key concessions in order to support the Hill Burton Act. And these decisions would shape the American medical landscape for decades to come. Hill Burton funded new hospitals in rural areas, but in order to get it passed, those segregationists in Congress also made sure that it would be the states rather than the federal government that controlled exactly how those government funds would be used. So states got their new hospitals, but segregationist politicians in those states also retained the power to keep black people out of those hospitals. The people who ended up benefiting from Hill Burton were white people in rural communities. Federal healthcare policy was by design, both implicitly and explicitly um, exclusionary to black Americans. As a result, black Americans faced an array of inequities, including statistically shorter lives, sicker lives, uh, excuse me, and sicker lives than their white counterparts. In addition to all of this, access to good medical care was based on employer-based insurance. And this also ended up hurting black communities because as David Barton Smith, an emeritus historian of health policy at Temple University said, black people were denied most of the jobs that offered insurance coverage. And even when some of them got health insurance, they couldn't make use of it at white facilities. In the shadows of this exclusion, Black communities created their own healthcare systems. Black women began a national community healthcare movement that included fundraising for Black healthcare facilities, campaigns to educate Black communities about nutrition, sanitation, and disease prevention, and programs like National Negro Health Week that drew national attention to racial health disparities. Black doctors and nurses, most of them trained at one of the two Black medical colleges in the United States, Mary Medical College or Howard University, established their own professional organizations like the National Medical Association and began to push back against medical segregation. By the 1950s, these organizations were pushing for a federal healthcare system for all American citizens. That fight put the National Medical Association in direct conflict with the American Medical Association, which at the time was opposed to a national healthcare plan. In the late 1930s and 1940s, the AMA helped defeat two proposals for a federal healthcare system with a campaign that sounds a lot like what we hear people say today. They said it was socialist to have uh, nationalized healthcare they warned of government intervention and doctor-patient relationships. In the mid-1960s, when proponents of national health care insurance introduced Medicare and the AMA used the same tactics to oppose it, this time the NMA was ready. They developed a counter message and they said health care is a basic human right. Civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. also helped share this message. He said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. As an aside, in an address to the National Medical Association in 2008, the AMA, the American Medical Association, will actually apologize 
for more than a century of policies that excluded Black Americans and actually hurt um, the health care of Black communities in the United States. Medicare and Medicaid were part of a broader plan that finally brought the legal segregation of hospitals to an end. The 1964 Civil Rights Act outlawed segregation for any entity receiving federal funds. And the new health care programs, Medicare and Medicaid, put every hospital in the country in that category. But they still excluded millions. Anyone who did not fit into a specific age, employment, or income groups, income groups still had little to no access to health care. In 2010, the Affordable Health Care Act brought insurance to nearly 20 million previously uninsured adults. It was the biggest, benef the biggest beneficiaries of the act were people of color, many of whom finally got the opportunity for insurance coverage because of the act's Medicaid expansion. However, several states refused to participate in Medicaid expansion. They argued that they should have states' rights and that they should be able to reject it. What's kind of interesting is that if we look at which states rejected the Medicaid expansion, it's no coincidence that most of them were also part of the formal, former Confederacy. So this map here shows you in blue states that accepted Medicaid expansion and states in orange that refused to expand Medicaid. And the map that I'm gonna show you next is a map of the country divided during the Civil War. Blue states are in the North, red states are in the South. It looks pretty similar. And several people are still trying to make access to the program, uh, Medicaid, excuse me, contingent on new work requirements. 150 years after the freed people of the South first petitioned the government for basic medical care, the United States remains the only high income country in the world where such care is not guaranteed to every citizen. In the United States, racial health disparities have proved as foundational as democracy itself. There has never been any period in American history where the health of blacks was equal to that of whites, says Evelyn Hammonds, a historian of science at Harvard University. And more than 150 years after the end of slavery, myths about black immunity to pain and weakened lung function continue to show up in modern day medical education and philosophy. Over the centuries, the two most persistent physiological myths that black people have higher pain tolerance and also that they have weakened lungs that can be strengthened through hard work have wormed their way into scientific consensus and they still remain today. Remember, I told you to remember Cartwright, the guy who came up with Dreptomania. His footprint remains embedded in current medical practice. To validate his theory about the lung inferiority in African-Americans, he became one of the first doctors in the US to measure um, lung function with an instrument called a spirometer. Spirometer, spirometer, not 100% sure how to say that correctly. Using a device he designed himself, he calculated that, quote, the deficiency in black people may be safely estimated at about 20%, meaning he believed that black lungs worked about 20% less effectively than white lungs. Even today, most commercially available spirometers used around the world to diagnose and monitor respiratory illness have what's called a race correction built into them, which controls for the assumption that black lungs have less capacity than white lungs. Recent data also shows that present day doctors fail to sufficiently treat the pain of black adults and children for many medical issues. There, was unfortunate, uh, there are unfortunately countless examples of this, including one here in Tallahassee where I am in 2016 when a black woman, Barbara Dawson, complained of abdominal pains at Calhoun Liberty, but the medical staff released her. They did not believe she was really in pain. When she refused to leave, the hospital called the police who handcuffed her and took her outside where she collapsed in the hospital driveway. Dawson returned to the hospital the next day, but died of a blood clot in her lungs. A 2013 review of studies examining racial disparities in pain management published in the American Medical Association Journal of Ethics found that black and Hispanic people from children to elders receive inadequate pain management compared to their counterparts. In 2016, a survey of 222 white medical students and residents uh, showed that half of them endorsed at least one myth 
about physiological differences between black people and white people, including their belief that black people's nerve endings are less sensitive than white people's. When asked to imagine how much pain white or black patients experienced in hypothetical situations, these medical students and residents insisted that black people felt less pain. This made the providers less likely to recommend appropriate treatment. A third of these doctors also still believed the lie that Thomas Hamilton tortured John Brown to prove nearly two centuries ago, that black skin is thicker than white skin. This disconnect allows scientists, doctors, and other medical providers, and those training to fill their positions, to ignore their own complicity in healthcare inequalities and to gloss over the internalized racism, both conscious and unconscious bias, that drive them to go against their oath to do no harm. Of the 402 years that Black people have been in America, including the colonial era, they have only possessed the very basic rights of citizenship for 57 of those years. And that history of racism has also impacted the health of Black Americans. Racism itself can also have profoundly negative health consequences. Epidemiologist Event Kozier and her colleagues have uncovered associations between frequent experiences of racism and higher risks of illness and obesity in African American women. Sleep researcher Michael Grander has found links between perceived racism and sleep disturbances. Public health scholar Mario Sims found that lifetime discrimination was associated with greater rates of hypertension among adult African Americans. The centuries old belief in racial differences in physiology has continued to mask the brutal effects of discrimination and structural inequalities, placing blame on black individuals and their communities for statistically poor health when compared with white communities. Rather than conceptualizing of race as a risk factor that predicts disease or disability, we should focus on understanding race as a proxy for bias, disadvantage and ill treatment. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Martinez, for, for walking us through this, this history and really appreciate this. Um, we have a few minutes for um, some questions. 